Yeah, with this panel, just super excited to hear about what's 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 on the cutting edge uh, in the NFT market uh, with new projects coming out. Um, what are they doing that's different from what we've already seen? And yeah, looking forward to the, the future of this. Thank you. Let's give it up. <laughs>
the power in a centralized, decentralized, enterprise, non-enterprise, SaaS, non-SaaS fashion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, we're just going to be uh, with our heads in the metaverse a lot more. And I think that's all I'll say because um, this, this space changes so quickly, it's so dynamic, that um, I'm excited and terrified at what's mm -hmm. coming next. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I think one of the questions that a lot of people outside of the space might ask is that theoretically you can do all of this without blockchain, without NFTs, that you can tokenize something just in software. It doesn't have to be on an immutable ledger. Right. Why is that not the case? Why do we need blockchain in order to do well, this? Well, blockchain really allows parties that don't know each other to trust each other, right? Mm -hmm. And it allows the disintermediation of middlemen that are taking a cut. Um, you know, if you think about a traditional bricks and mortar art gallery, they take a 50% cut of all the sales. You know, but if you sell your artwork on OpenSea, you're only uh, uh, getting subject to a 2.5% uh, fee. And you can trust that OpenSea is going to get you that royalty payment on secondary sales and make sure you get all the, the primary sales revenue um, because of the power of blockchain, being able to trust parties that you don't know. Um, so I think it is important. I mean, obviously, the blockchain isn't the answer to everything, but it does solve that problem rather well. Mm -hmm. And it globalizes the interaction that we can have because of the fractionalization that you're able to do. And you can verify every, every transaction. So mm -hmm. you can, like you were saying, it's trustless. Um, so then that opens it up to anywhere on the globe. And, and that, that can yeah. accelerate growth rapidly, and that's why we're seeing the rapid growth that we're seeing. Yeah. I think there's a lot of um, extremely deep um, benefits to blockchain that people who aren't necessarily with a technical bent of mind don't understand, like fast finality and interoperability and unified liquidity and basically just being able to send money from point A to point B um, or, you know, leaving a nation state um, war or famine or earthquake or force majeure. If if, if, you, if you will, and mm -hmm. going over to the other side with a seed phrase in your head and recovering your life's earnings, I think the true power of the blockchain is its immutability, the fact that it cannot be suppressed and um, that suppression is designed into human society. And I think um, blockchain is technology, but um, it, it also, therefore, has a lot of downfalls. Mm -hmm. And I think right now we're just on the peg end of this bell curve. We haven't even touched the top. We haven't even scratched the surface. So I'm very excited by this, um, you know, the loads of possibilities coming up. But uh, we have a long way to go, and there'll be a lot of, a lot more breaking before there is a lot more making. So, so you're saying oh. we're still early? Very early. Yeah. Probably nothing. <laughs> I mean, one of the th things that you sort of touched on there, I think is important. Um, I was talking to the team at Fabricant yesterday and that they mentioned around like the language to do with uh, Web3s and uh, NFTs especially. Yeah. Like how much of the general public actually knows what fungibility is. Yeah. Do you think that that's something we'll see evolve over time in terms of language? I know Meta with their NFTs, are, they're referring to them as digital collectibles. They're not actually using NFTs in their marketing. Surprisingly, I, NFT, the word, hasn't, slow down the adoption. Um, I, know, I know a lot of artists, and they came into the space not from the crypto. I'm a crypto native, so it was a natural progression for me. And they had zero experience with crypto, um, zero knowledge, and still do to some extent, but <laughs> enough to mint their works and get in the space. And then they start to learn from that angle, because now they have ETH. So they're like, okay, how do I manage the ETH? So it was a very different onboarding for them, and the word NFT didn't slow them down at all. They didn't find it intimidating, you know, okay. that it meant non-fungible token, and they learned along the way. Mm -hmm. And so it was um, interesting to watch, because some people predicted it would be yeah. sort of a, a barrier, and it didn't. It didn't. I, I would agree way. with you there. Yeah, I, I think yeah. a lot of people might not know what non-fungibility is. They might not even know what a token is. But people understand that NFT as a symbol means, you know, artists liberating their works from uh, gatekeepers, from middlemen, and uh, being able to take back control of their creative uh, works. Mm -hmm. People get that. Yeah, yeah. I think um, there's two hats to wear here. Um, specifically for me, I, I work with crypto legal quite a bit. So I feel like when you actually brought that up, the fact that they don't want to nomenclature NFTs, I feel like they also don't want to call it like, hey, this is not a taxable asset. This is a digital asset because our lawyers told us so. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot more physical brands will do that, especially as nation state laws start to tighten. Uh, but on the other side, I'm so fond of the work that people like the Fabricant are doing because they work with Adidas and they work with everybody else. They speak layman language. Mm -hmm. They don't confuse uh, tokenomics or fungibility 
your token holds. Like, you don't have to know that to own an NFT designed pair of shoes and just own it for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that, you know, that's, there's like this huge chasm in awareness mm -hmm. that brands like this are trying to patch. And um, I think awareness is going to be uh, pretty much where the next five years lie. It's going to be an education game. How soon can we educate people? How well we can educate them? The downfalls of that, the pitfalls, and uh, how fast that accelerates adoption. So it's going to be interesting as always. It could be called many things in yeah. the future. Yeah. If we're talking about the Absolutely. future of NFTs, mm -hmm. there could be many names Absolutely. that we see them designated yeah. as. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but people will know more the utility of that thing yeah. will be more important to them than the name yeah. of it, really, yeah. overall. Well, that, that builds onto what I was just thinking in that one of the other struggles that we still have is the fact that people outside the space still think that you can right-click, save as, JPEG, <laughs> and that's the same thing. Yeah. How do you think we're going to get around that in the future? Is it just education? Is it time? Education's a big part of it, but I mean, the, the simplest way to, to think about it is, you know, you can still go to the Louvre in Paris and take a picture of the Mona Lisa, but it doesn't mean you own it. And so this problem is not unique to NFTs. It exists with traditional art as well. Um, but um, utility is, is the, 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 another big way of getting people to understand. It's not just an artwork. It's not just buying a digital good. It's being part of a community. You're getting fringe benefits. You know, in the context of music, for instance, uh, you might uh, purchase an NFT to become a member of a fan club uh, for a given artist. And then you go to a gig, you check in, I know that you've, uh, you're a member of the fan club, you've been to the event, I send you a two-minute hits reel after the show. It's yeah. another NFT you know, of all the, the greatest moments from the gig that you just went to. Mm -hmm. um, sometime in future, if you've been to six gigs in a year, you get another NFT, all these kind of additional things. Uh, maybe I, I send you a real-world good or something to kind of you know, um, reward you for being part of the community for so long. And if I get bored of the band, if I get bored of the artist, I sell the NFT to someone else. Yeah. So you're guaranteed that the people that own your NFTs are engaged members of your community. Mm -hmm. Now, this is really powerful stuff. You know, It's more than just you know, right-click saving an image, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's going to be one of the key things that you say, utility. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think the, the current, um, well, we're going to be all going to talk about the future, but do you think in the future then we are going to be moving into NFTs all having utility, or is there still a, a space for just the pure art form in terms of ownership and collectibles? I think um, it's going to be a little bit of both, mm -hmm. because... Um, Creative expression is an extremely large subset, and it exists on a spectrum. So one of the reasons why people right-click Save As is because they associate. They, like, I, I find an image of the black cat on the internet might not necessarily be an NFT. I'm going to right-click Save As, because <laughs> that's just who I am, sadly. But um, if that image then goes into a vault and pays me a dividend, I don't get that doesn't matter if I right-click Save As. If that is a fractionalized piece of ownership of real estate, like we were talking about, if that's a charitable donation, mm -hmm. if that is associated with the right-click Twitter embed that they've just made right now, or like several other platforms, like Google Connect was sort of like adopted on 50,000 websites overnight, and that's what shot to fame. Same thing with Facebook Connect. Um, I don't see the reason why MetaMask Connect and Trust Wallet Connect cannot be a thing in the future. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's where also connectability as a one-click sign-in is a form of utility, just like they've been saying. So um, I think there's always going to be two sides to that spectrum. And um, I think that's OK. Mm -hmm. So I mean, on that then, do you think that, um, that digital identity through tokenization and NFTs is going to be part of our future? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I think it, you wear it as a badge. Mm -hmm. um, you park it in your basket of portfolio as an asset. You fractionalize it depending on the project. Um, and you move from this, you know, it's like going through a shopaholic phase where you cut up your credit cards because you, you bought one too many NFTs, and I've been there, done that. Um, ashamedly have several hot wallets with several NFTs that I've never even listed because I just bought them <laughs> for no reason off the market and burned mm -hmm. several thousands of dollars. But also you move towards the migration of, okay, now I'm done with that phase, mm -hmm. the burn and flip or buy and burn sort of thing. And now I'm moving towards a more utility oriented aspect. And it's nice. I think um, even with the pitfalls of uh, the problems of right click save as a JPEG um, is born the education aspect of what is a, what is an NFT? I bought my first NFT and it was a cool cat or a gar cat and now I buy my next NFT and it's a fractionalized piece of land. So it can be both. It's partly it's definitely education, but it's also seeing what's happening for other people around you because yeah. if you own if you owned Azuki when I was at their 
after party, you were the one who got the airdrop that was sure. worth overnight $60,000, right? Mm -hmm. wow. And mm -hmm. that, that word gets out really fast, Yes. right? Yeah. Everyone like, oh, well, if I had an Azuki in my wallet, yeah. I would have gotten that airdrop. So you see the benefits, not just um, right click, not just having it, Absolutely. you know, just having the art. You also Absolutely. have the benefit of ownership. Yeah. Yeah. And people will say to me, well, what else does I get? You know, I go, I own it, and therefore I can sell it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't sell it. I can sell it. Yeah. And that's on the blockchain. So yeah. on who owns these NFTs. The secondary market value. Yeah. And Absolutely. so yeah. it'll be a transition to know what the value of ownership is mm -hmm. as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. It's not just a value for yourself. Mm -hmm. gratifications. So. I, I think one, one thing is, is true as well, uh, is that while, while moving into the future, we're going to see more exotic forms of utility that uh, NFTs um, uh, confer to, to holders, but we're still going to see certain classes of NFTs that are just about the art. Um, and particularly, uh, I, I, I also do some work as a generative artist um, uh, with my Dynastripes art project. And in that field where people are focusing on pure art, actually adding utility can be seen as crass or banal because it's no longer just about the art you're trying to mm -hmm. shill. You're creating this thing that's more exotic than just the art standing alone on its own two legs. So I think we'll probably still see, even into the future, that certain NFTs are still there just to create an amazing work of something uh, that, that doesn't have utility beyond itself. Well, so, uh, there, uh, there might be utility in how we display that too. I've been at parties be where, yeah, where you can, point, if yeah. you have that NFT in your wallet, you can project it on the wall. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's sort of like a jukebox, but a visual art, mm -hmm. right? And so you can take turns. I've been at events mm -hmm. where there's these things called casters. And if it's in, if you own that NFT in your MetaMask, you can cast it. Yeah. And then everyone's like, whoa. And it sort of gives you some social cred, right? So yeah. um, it, it's just going to be a different experience yeah. and people will want to be a part of that experience yeah. and so how you are in the world will change because of the technology behind it which is true of our current day i mean you know smartphones changed our life almost overnight right so mm -hmm. it, it we'll see that develop over time so i mean talking about the the technology uh, richard you and i were, were talking briefly about how that could be holding us back right now yeah. Um, say digital storage on the blockchain, IPFS, yeah. like mm -hmm. it, it's still slow in relation to say centralized servers, and yeah. then we have the issue where uh, something like 70% like of projects on Ethereum are all centralized through AWS. Like mm -hmm. that, that is potentially a problem when we're trying to say that everything's decentralized. This, what what yeah. do we need to do in the future to, to solve that problem? So, so this is a big issue in my mind. I, uh, I, I'm a technologist. I write a lot of smart contracts myself, both for token tracks and for my own personal art projects. And uh, you know, I inspect a lot of smart contracts. You know, I like to dive into the hood and see what they're doing. And most uh, NFT projects, what you're looking at really is an ID and then a link to content elsewhere. The artwork is off-chain. And uh, sometimes that's a centralized web server, which is really bad, because the owner of that server could change the underlying artwork. They mm -hmm. could, it could go offline. The company could go to defunct. Uh, what, what's better is using a distributed file system like IPFS or Arweave, but it's still not great because instead of just being uh, the blockchain that uh, holds the artwork, you're still dependent on a second system that is not necessarily going to be around forever. There's no guarantees that Ar Arweave or IPFS are going to be around forever. Blockchains fall into disrepair. Distributed systems fall into disrepair. Uh, and suddenly you've got two things that you're dependent on for your artwork to be uh, permanent. That, that's a big issue in my mind. But I think, you know, looking into the future, what we're going to see is is as the uh, performance and storage constraints of blockchains uh, become much better than they are right now, because right now they're terrible, um, we'll see more art going entirely on chain. And that really excites me. Five or 10 years' time, it's conceivable that all artwork will be on chain. And suddenly, you only have to worry about Ethereum going offline, or you know, whatever L1 you're using going offline, and that, which is not you know, a, a, a very likely situation. So, but but what, what do we need to do that? Like, is it, do we need a different layer two? Well, like, it, is no. it, it could be, no. Yeah, it could be the architecture of the blockchain. It could be using L2 solutions. You're right. There's there's a, a lot of different ways of addressing it, but it is something that does need to be addressed. I mean, right now, you know, as we're probably all aware, you know, if you execute something on a smart contract, uh, that happens on every single node in the Ethereum network, which is you know built for uh, redundancy, but it's not built for uh, performance or scale. You know, um, doing doing you know things at scale. You know, uh, so. Mm. Mm. I think that's a much larger blockchain problem in general. It, it is. Yeah. Docker yeah. is centralized. Kubernetes is centralized. It's not just AWS. Versail is centralized. Mm. Cloudflare is centralized. Mm. Web hosting services are centralized. Mm. Everything is centralized. Akash is trying to do decentralized cloud. And I know a few other services, but they haven't really perfected their model, which is also why RV have got so famous in the first place. Mm. Um, we don't even know if Satoshi Nakamura runs a decentralized node for the primary <laughs> master node of Bitcoin. So I think that unpacks to 
a basal foundational educational awareness problem mm -hmm. in that you are not susceptible you're not not susceptible to attacks if your core like bare bones hardware is not centralized is not decentralized mm -hmm. and um i feel like that's uh that's like this trillion dollar industry that's going to float into hardware because everyone's yeah. only thinking mining right now and um no one even realizes that if you run decentralized servers that's going to be so much money <laughs> yeah. and it's an awareness problem so if it unpacks to that uh i think you know we're we're sitting on the greatest tectonic shift since the industrial revolution so it's um everything is centralized like pretty much most ethereum nodes are centralized mm -hmm. we just don't know about them yeah. Yeah. So it's not just an nft problem and so i feel bad when people uh poop on open sea i mean yes you must poop on them they are centralized the problem <laughs> but um you know by them just decentralizing 51% of the nodes like we say in blockchain it doesn't fix the problem no but it, but i'd say it's not black and white either you know there's yeah. the various shades, shades of gray, of gray. with the, yeah. the decentralized you know kind of uh, spectrum Mm -hmm. yeah. The solution is probably something that hasn't even been exactly. invented, invented yet. yet. Yeah. And which, is, which, which is what's lovely about the whole space. It's emergent. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So these solutions emerge out of the need. Yeah, yeah true. So we'll, we'll see a solution at some yeah. point. So in the future, I mean, or in this, in this, we can kind of go just like within a year because like, it's going to be difficult. But what do you think are the absolute best use cases for, for common users of NFTs? Mm. Common and what users. would they be? Common use, like, so, because my next question is going to be talking about institutional and, and sort of like Got enterprise. So, for everyday retail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think would be best the best use case? Use so, 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 sorry. Subject. We, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, for, for me, it's about connecting um, fans with the artist um, and allowing kind of new ways of kind of uh, managing that fan base, of allowing uh, fans to interact with the artist. Uh, NFTs are such a great way of doing that, of building an engaged community. If you if you if you want out, you just sell the NFT to someone else. You're guaranteed that the people that own your NFTs are invested, and you know having that channel to someone's kind of Ethereum address or their their Zilliqa address or whatever address it is um, is a really powerful thing. You know, it's an easy way to uh, allow uh, discounts on gig tickets or you know airdrop someone content or mm -hmm. keep them engaged somewhere. It's much better than say knowing uh, someone's email address or knowing their phone number. People change their emails, they change their phone numbers, and you know sometimes you know they, maybe the person loses interest in the band, and suddenly you're, you're paying for a MailChimp subscription and bombing all these people with emails that uh, is costing you a fortune, and they don't even like the band anymore because they grew out of you or something like that. So, so I think, um, yeah, for, for, for the, the average consumer, uh, NFTs are going to become the de facto standard way people interact as, as fans of an artist, and actually take part in the success of the band or the artist as well, because mm -hmm. you know, they get a little bit of economic kind of um, a lift as well if they sell the NFT at a premium or you know, at, a, at, a, at, a, at better what they paid for it. So they get to take part in the success of the band. I think that's a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, along those same lines, I think uh, from a, again, I'm more macro viewed is is the releasing of the cre creative people. Mm -hmm. So there's art, but I'm, my next venture is more into DSI, which is decentralized science. So I feel like that direct connection from the scientists to get their funding direct from the people, which mm. I believe science belongs to us. Oh, it, and so yeah. it it's that it's removing that intermediary, which right now for them is the government funding. Um, and so they have more freedom to do what they want to do, to do the research they want to do, just as artists have found more freedom to create the art they want to create. If they can go direct to those that hold the NFTs or, or to the um, stakeholders, which is opens it up to everyone is a stakeholder. And so that changes the mentality and the shift of the value of what they're doing. More people see value in it and can invest in that value and reap the rewards of that value. And, and there's definitely a massive community. I mean, I was involved in using my Ethereum rig at the time to mine for trying to find the um, vaccine for COVID. And there was mm -hmm. millions of people all around the world doing exactly the same thing. Oh. And you kind of opening up those those people to a similar thing to carry on with those sort of endeavors. Yeah, it's it's a movement. They're, they're actually having um, a conference in two weeks in Berlin, and they really want to get away from these centralized sources. Yeah. And, and NFTs and tokenization is a way to do that. And so it will free science right? and the scientists, just as it has done to artists, and will continue to do to more areas and yeah. more industries. Yeah. Yeah. I think my take is more generic, but it's also some, somehow extremely personal because the permutations are just infinite. So everything from school and university education records going into one 
file folded NFT capsule mm -hmm. or land rights and indigenous land rights and all kind of um, you know grassroots problems that nobody yeah. wants to so solve, like the last mile logistics going mm -hmm. into one capsule. Uh, these may not necessarily be limited to NFTs, uh, but also in the same vein of DeFi, we actually contribute to complexity and we run Complexity DAO, which is just a bunch of complexity scientists coming together, and um, they struggle to get funded from maybe an AdGeo or an Asia.com. Not everybody can get published, so academia and authorship. Like imagine if you're, mm. um, you, you know, writing a book and you want to only produce 10 or 50 versions of the ebook, and you fractionalize said ebook and you sell it, and your royalties for life. The problem with the second-hand book market is you don't get royalties mm -hmm. once it's sold into a secondary market. And that sort of really changes things for academia because mm -hmm. academia is not the best debate fields and that sort of sets us back as a human civilization. So I think NFTs, um, once we understand their utility to more than asset classes, I think that's my beef with NFTs is that at this point we only think of them as like gold and land, like mm -hmm. something you can trade. But once we think of them as non-fungible or fingerprint or image print, um, I think there's just so much more that will open up, especially when we move to platforms that are gas efficient. So people mm -hmm. won't mind um, having more generic daily life use cases yeah. for them. No, uh, definitely. I, I really love this idea of you know, hearing about all these new creative ideas yeah. that you can uh, capture in, in NFT format. Mm -hmm. And you know, academic um, goods like you, you were just talking about, wow, that's, that's super cool. And, and I think you know, me as a technologist, I tend to come at it uh, from a technology angle. And I think, well, software, yeah. that's a creative good too. Why aren't we capturing that on blockchain? Yeah. You know, it could be um, mobile apps. It could be an Alexa skill. It could be an if this, then that applet or something. There's so many things that we can move to blockchain, allow people to trade. And you know, it's, 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 it's exciting to me. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that there's a second-hand market, because, I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't that long ago that you bought a CD from a band, you mm -hmm. could sell yeah, that for a few exactly. quid afterwards. Mm -hmm. and, like, none of that happens now, because everything's digital, but the ownership mm -hmm. is, it disappears, doesn't yeah. it? Also, in a slightly more existential vein, I think um, it's going to be interesting with um, things like Constitution DAO and like uh -huh. City DAO. It's like people are just going to be like, we'll buy that, we'll solve that problem. Mm -hmm. We're going to raise $47 million from a meme and we're going to attempt to buy the Constitution in an mm -hmm. attempt to fix it. Yeah, yeah. And then when it doesn't work, we're going to go through that, the pain of unpacking that and refunding everybody, but we're going to attempt it. And I've heard of like Edward Snowden DAO, like trying to free him, like free Assange DAO. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it's crazy. Like imagine I movements <laughs> that yeah. gather like, you know, faith and trust from all over the world mm -hmm. in ETH, in Bitcoin, in actual blue chips mm -hmm. and coming together as a collective hive mind. Yeah. And I think that is so freeing. Um, I think the blockchain and, you know, NFTs, like imagine taking Jack's first tweet and turning that into an NFT, and imagine bidding for that on a secondary market would be crazy. So I think it's gonna, the future is gonna well, be like the ownership well, of <laughs> he, unique. He did put it up for sale recently. Very, he did? I, yeah. Yeah. yeah the bid didn't How go much very high. I think it, the highest bid was like $150. It was less, it was like 60 something. $150? Yeah. Mm. But that was It was the like 66,000, I think it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, but, but he way didn't less sell than it. what he was didn't paid sell up. it, did he? No, yeah. he didn't sell it. But mm. yeah, it's gonna move beyond where we're seeing it yeah. now by far. It's exciting. You know, it's gonna move into entirely different areas. So moving on from there. What do you think is going to be the best use case from a kind of an enterprise institutional point of view that could maybe help adoption um, in the future? How could you see sort of big institutional players or enterprise companies using NFTs? Well, we're only seeing a little bit of it. I mean, for instance, you know, um, Uniswap v3. You know, um, if you deposit into a liquidity pool, you know, the you get a token that's an NFT representing that deposit. So we're seeing things like that. Um, also, you know, there, there's companies that are working on uh, taking NFT as collateral and giving you loans on them. Mm -hmm. So, so there, there's stuff happening in that space. Um, it's it's fair to say it's very nascent. I, I don't know if yeah. you guys have come across anything else of interest. Yeah, that's, I think that's it's. Um I think as somebody who advises, has advised VCs in a past life also, we take a conscious step back from something like institutional adoption for yeah. NFTs. Like, if you're bidding on an ape that was bought by, I don't know, Eminem or whoever, then it is an ex Eminem ape. I get that. It may have an asset value that might have value on a secondary market, but otherwise, it's an extremely diversified and forward thinking institution that would choose to invest in NFTs as an asset class. So when you have stocks, you have bonds, you have real estate, you have gold, whatever it is that you diversify in, as a VC, um, the choice of basket is very different for everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, as we're seeing with the past 24 hours, even stable coins are getting tricky to really like digest. So I think NFTs, um, 
I mean, unless somebody does paper gold ETFs and turns those into NFTs for a specific numeric on a gold bar, like, I think it's going to be a while before um, institutions can stomach um, the amount of um, money that comes with, um, like, investing in maybe, like, a mm. post-celebrity NFT or something like that, like mm -hmm. Tesla's very first model, of Ford's very first model, the very first Ford engine, like, maybe if you were bullish um, and from like a behemoth in the automobile industry, you would buy that as an NFT. But mm -hmm. otherwise, I guess like it'll either be smoking jacket, like premium value, or it will be like extreme asset class value. So I really don't know how to answer that one. <laughs> uh, from a, from a degen perspective, um, we don't really see it as beneficial to the, mm -hmm. the overall space uh, because it's community-based. Yeah. Um, in fact, we analyze projects based on the strength of their community before we, we come together every week and we analyze projects, the pros and cons, um, some of us. And that is definitely one of them, the strength of the community. And if, if there's a lot of institutional interest in it, that doesn't necessarily strength, that doesn't strengthen yeah. the community. It, it's more, yeah. you know, boots on the ground people, yeah. you know, and... Um, it may benefit them, the institution, but I, I, the space I mean, as a yeah. whole, I don't, I don't really see it. There's also something to be said about, let's say, if I work at, uh, and don't, don't, don't hang me for this, but if I work at like Goldman Sachs, or like a A16C or whatever, um, maybe you know, like you have office retreats, maybe you could get comped off on a PFP project that you sort of pseudo invested in, mm -hmm. and everybody on the team gets comped off. So the page of your team on your website suddenly is full of cats and dogs and demons and <laughs> apes and monkeys and whatevers and what have you. And then those get into a master portfolio of sorts because they already have large portfolios in crypto mm -hmm. or Paradigm or Shapeshift, like really forward thinking VCs like that. Like that would be cool. Like imagine all of them flaunt flaunting that on a LinkedIn. That's really good for the space. So I'm like extremely anti-maxi. So for me, everything is good. <laughs> you know, it always has like a element of adoption. Everything is adoption. Even the bad is adoption. And you know, I see this from a point of privilege because you know I have high loss appetite. Not everybody has that. But I just feel like um, the more institution walks into crypto, the better it is for us as like as a people. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I just think it's an intermediary to where we we see the most optimized use yeah. of the technology yeah. in the space because uh, yeah everyone should get involved and inst institutions is fine but in the end i think it'll be the demise of some of them so, yeah. Yeah. so you know it, it's to their advantage to get involved somehow and so mm -hmm. that they don't yeah. become irrelevant yeah. Because yeah. that that was why the technology was created was to get rid yeah. of the middleman or mm -hmm. the centralized organization and, and it's not to say they'll go away but maybe to recreate how they interplay with it and or how they are involved so that they do stay relevant somehow. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's yeah. a good point. Um, you know, we are seeing a lot of business come into the NFT space and w a common play for them is, you know, a traditional business, a, a fashion house, something like that. They're trying to tie uh, real world physical goods uh, to the blockchain using NFTs, that sort of thing. And I gotta admit, I'm a little skeptical of that because it doesn't solve the problem of, of counterfeit. I mean, you know, I, I was speaking with someone yesterday and they said they'd bought a, a pair of sneakers and uh, it was an addition of 200 physical real world sneakers and he knew that that was always going to be the case because it was an NFT backing each pair. But what is to stop the fashion house from creating a 201st pair and then minting another NFT and says, oh, that's also number one. You know, um, you know the, the NFT doesn't prove anything. If I presented you with two pairs of shoes that are both, both of the serial number corresponding to the first you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, edition of that pair of shoes, which one's the real one? You know, um, it, you know, so there's still a problem with, you know, a, a company or someone or something having to verify, oh, that's the actual real one that's tied to the blockchain. And we can't actually really, you know, f digitally fingerprint a real world physical good right now in such a way that we can tie it safely to a blockchain so that you can't have that other kind of centralized uh, party conferring trust. There are chips. So some, oh. some clothing companies are doing it, but there's a chip that they embed in, in the jacket or the shirt. What if I just take the chip and put it into another jacket? Yeah. What if I have I a palette know, of, know. you know, organic <laughs> oranges and I right. dump them out and give them all to my mates, and then I fill it up with normal oranges, and then I sell that one on. You know, again, they're, they're, you have to trust that someone's not going to do that, and so blockchain, wh what does it give you? You know, <laughs> well, I mean, I the guess the, the, on the ownership then is of the chip, essentially, isn't it, rather than of, point, of yeah. the, the item. But I think if you're, you're aware of that, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. 
I think, I think the largest way institution. Kind of digitally fingerprint the good. Like if I could somehow get the DNA of the orange or something, and oh, that's definitely that orange. It's on the blockchain. Sure, great. But we're no long way off from that, aren't we? But that's not that's uh, not institutional <laughs> adoption. That's like uh, well, I mean, to see for sure technology, technology, be technology technically. Yeah. 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 Enterprise, I guess. Yeah. I like mean, I think the biggest institution that will really, really adopt crypto is media. We really mm -hmm. benefit from crypto is media. Media is a behemoth, right? It's it's the oldest trillion dollar industry as we know it mm -hmm. since the age of time, and media is going to go apes, mm. pun intended, over NFTs. And so I think just, just, that's just a great stepping stone uh, for institutional adoption. So the more they talk about it, the more they um, sort of research it and sort of like really hack into it, really unpack it, I think the more um, we all benefit. So, I mean, we've obviously seen um, financial um, industry kind of pushing back on crypto as a whole um, because of the threat that it is to the tradi traditional system. Are we seeing that already from an NFT point of view, or do we see that in future? You say you're talking about companies that essentially could be threatened. Let's think of like music rights, like PRS, uh -huh. like the idea of digital music rights going onto the blockchain. That's a big threat for them unless they yeah. get involved. It could <laughs> be absolutely a threat. right. But I'm seeing them really want to be a part of it, and I'm sure you've seen this too, especially in the music industry. Mm -hmm. They're they're trying to figure out how they can be a part of it, as yeah. opposed to pushing back against it. Yeah. Where we might see pushback is when it does start to make a big dent in the financial s sector. Um, we're seeing more money creation in the NFT creation, but, but, they're, but it's not like DeFi, which was sort of a, you know, directly opposite to the traditional financial tools that are currently being mm -hmm. used. So if we start to see fractionalization and token, more tokenization used with NFTs, p potentially, especially if you start fractionalizing ownership of homes or, or mm. commercial real estate or, or something like that, and it starts to break into sort of the financial sector a little bit, and there's competition there. But then again, you could see them try to adopt it. I mean, ex exactly. I mean, you look at, say, conveyancing firms could mm -hmm. theoretically just disappear if like houses go onto the blockchain, you can go from it taking, I mean, I bought a house last year, it took me literally eight months to complete. You right. could complete in weeks. Uh -huh. The minimum energy Days. industry, the minimum yeah, industry, yeah. 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 I think there's also a lot of, of IP that will come under direct threat because you can't control yeah. IP anymore, you can't buy and sell. Patents as an industry comes under threat, right? Because mm -hmm. what stops me from making something is just blasting it on the blockchain instead of some little poor little scribe somewhere that someone has to subscribe two dollars for. You know, it's, I, I think it's, it's going to make a huge dent in the way that um, capitalist society is used to everyday transaction of trade, like buy IP, sell IP, buy rights, sell rights, music, otherwise even the secondary market on music is the same thing, right? Um, when it goes into a secondary market, the artist loses royalty. So I think royalties in general is like a huge catchphrase yeah. for artists, publishers, musicians, what have Absolutely. you. It's like everyone in the creative industry benefits monetarily so much more. Mm -hmm. So yeah. why would they not? Which is exactly why, as Dana said, everyone wants in because it's too hard to ignore. Mm -hmm. Well, the writing's on the wall, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. At Token Tracks, we've got uh, good relationships with both Warner Music and Sony Music, and we're working with our artists on those labels to bring their music to blockchain. And we're actually finding the record Labels are not pushing back quite as hard as we thought they might. But okay. I think it's because they recognize the writing is on the wall and they need mm -hmm. to get on board. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where things do get really complicated is with royalties, uh, mm -hmm. as, as you were saying. Uh, you know, you've got different royalties based on different regions, different uh, modes of, um, of, of the creative's operation, whether it be kind of streaming rights, master rights, publishing rights, and so on. Um, it's a complicated thing. We've got a whole legal team working on it full time <laughs> at, uh, at Token Tracks. And what we're trying to do is build a, uh, a royalty inclusive NFT product that will um, ascribe royalties to you, um, sort of like what Royal is doing, Royal.io that also has a royalty um, inclusive uh, product, but there'll, there'll be a twist on it, um, something we're hoping to launch later this year. I, th I think that's the only thing that's really holding back the music industry mm -hmm. from flourishing at this moment. There, there's so many hands in each project that they're having a yeah. difficult time working with the technology to partition out mm -hmm. the royalties where they need to go, mm -hmm. but once that's figured out, I believe music NFTs will, f will take off like wildfire, more than art, because there's only... A, small sector of communities that are into art, mm. but everyone listens to music all around the world in their own genres of music. So once that gets figured out, it'll probably take NFTs to a whole other level that yeah, we haven't seen so. yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Yeah. So the question that I'm thinking at the moment is around um, a, a coming or a current bear market in terms of crypto. Mm -hmm. um, can NFTs be a hedge? How will they survive? 
how do you, what, what do you think NFTs are going to be like compared to kind of other asset classes in uh, the crypto industry over the next year? I feel they can be a hedge. Currently, they're not. Um, my NFTs are down <laughs> as well. You know, all the, the floors just drop. Yeah. I mean, significantly because people are, are trying, just like in crypto or even stocks, they're trying to get the money out. And so everyone's, it's a race to the bottom price. And you want yours to sell first. You know, I've done it. <laughs> you just put your NFT at the very, so that it sells first and you, you liquidate, you know, you get mm -hmm. the cash out. Yeah. So you're more liquid in these times. Um, so we're seeing a correlation across the board. Even, I mean, in the crypto space, we always, the ever elusive uncoupling, you know, we just want it to uncouple yeah. from the market and it never no. does. It, it, yeah. just, it follows. It's less now than it was before, yeah. but it still follows pretty closely. So hopefully when we see it, if there is an uncoupling, which is what we want, you will see it as a hedge. Currently it's not. No. And I, I'd agree with you there for sure. Um, you know, any risk asset right now is under threat right now, given you know the macro conditions, and then of course with what's been going on in the crypto space. Um, all, all these things are uh, correlated, and uh, NFTs represent a, an extremely ris risky asset class within an extremely risky as as asset class. And uh, you know the stuff that's going on with Terra and USDT, and and uh, yeah, it's all it's all weighing on uh, on the on the scene, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I just, it's just a no from me, like, no, it's not, it's just like, no, <laughs> it's, it's true, I mean, in the future, unless, you know, um, your NFT is a Monet, a physical copy of a Monet sitting somewhere in Chris Christie's or Sotheby's, and you own the digital asset, uh, the up and down of volatility, a fluctuation of that asset has no impact on your Monet print, that's fine, if you want a piece of land, Land doesn't care about Bitcoin, it doesn't care about ETH, because you know, de decoupling is actually a mathematical anomaly. Like it, it literally, one cannot exist without the other. So when people say decoupling, we all say decoupling, I say it a lot. It's, it's so hard to actually do it, because mm -hmm. they're all really interlinked, and that's just the history of Wall Street, mm -hmm. even like before crypto, which, which is where crypto was sort of born out of. So mm. no, it was just uh, gonna be a while before they ever hedge. Okay, so we've only got uh, a few seconds left. Let's, let's finish on just quickly one project that you all think will still be around in five, ten years' time in terms of NFTs. Oof. <laughs> We're lucky to think a year ahead in the NFT space. Go yeah, I'll, I'll go with something you know, okay. that you could probably guess for me. Like, I, I think the most on-chain generative art will still be around, uh, just by virtue of the fact that it's only dependent on the blockchain alone uh, to survive. Um, and I think um, you know, stuff from uh, artists like Joris Vormans and uh, various others that have launched on Artblocks or uh, other generative platforms. Tezos is a great place to go looking for generative on-chain art. Um, I think we'll see that uh, persist uh, into the future for, for mm -hmm. some years to come. Um, more short term, I think the Clonex Artifact Studios is doing some really interesting things, and I, um, you know, I've been into them before Nike bought them, but uh, they, they just execute, execute, execute. They don't talk about what they're going to do; they just keep building. So they're building some sort of ecosystem. I've had hints of it, um, but they don't say much. It's almost like the Apple of the NFT mm -hmm. space. You know, you're lucky to find out anything, but I think they're working on something pretty big. Mm -hmm. I don't know about a specific project, but I think um, I know of several artists who physically paint artwork and pre-mint, they sort of mint the pictures. They put them on OpenSea in a collection. Once the blue check goes up, um, if you buy it, um, you burn it, you can actually, oh, that's a blockchain baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, you burn it, you can actually get the artist to ship you the physical print. Okay, cool. That industry is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I think we're just getting started. There's going to be so much more of, um, like, you know, we're going to be done with the whole repeated Picasso prints and repeated Monet prints. There's just going to be a huge generation of virtual museums, virtual galleries, and mm -hmm. people continue to paint and paint with vigor. They mm -hmm. don't worry about um, monetary benefit as much as, you know, how we know artists are always underpaid. I think that that's one industry that's not going anywhere. Fantastic. All right. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank Great you. to be here. Cheers. <laughs>